Well, I want to welcome you to our Sunday evening online. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. And uh, it's always a blessing to be able to share the Word of God with you. And so uh, if you're just joining us online tonight, take just a minute and uh, like this or share this. Let others know that uh, we're on live right now. Maybe check in. Let us know where you're watching from. And we want to thank you for being a part of our online. Many of you are watching on applications where you can't do that. And uh, I certainly understand that. But uh, let others know. Maybe send out a text. Let people know that you're watching. And I know that it'll encourage others. And we want others to join us on our Sunday night online. We want to thank you for uh, being faithful this morning. Many of you were uh, in your place this Sunday morning. And what a wonderful service that we had. My voice is still a little bit hoarse from today. I've been under the weather some this week. And uh, I want to thank everybody who's prayed for me. Uh, it's been a number of years since I've been sick. But I, uh, I came down with it this week. And it was really an unusual week. It was a, a sore throat on Tuesday. I felt pretty decent on, on Wednesday with no, no sore throat. And then Thursday and Friday... I uh, really, really went downhill, but uh, my wife took good care of me, and you know how we men are with a cold or the flu, I guess. We, it's like, uh, it's like, you know, probably the equivalent to a, a lady having a baby, and so that's what I've been through this week, uh, but really appreciate those of you that prayed, and my, my voice has been a little weak today. But the Lord gave us a wonderful service in spite of that this morning. Had a wonderful starting point class today with 25 or so new uh, uh, members that are looking for membership. And so we're just so thankful for what God is doing here and how he is building his church. And we're so grateful for life at Front Range. Thank the Lord for working in all of our hearts, the encouragement that it is to see new new families come. Uh, This morning also, we had several who responded to the invitation, who came to Christ this morning. And I tell you, it was a joy to just get to meet uh, a dear lady after church and just see tears of joy of coming to Christ and knowing that her sins had been forgiven, that Jesus Christ was her Lord and Savior. And there is nothing like new life in Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful for that. And so if you were there this morning, you know, if you weren't there, you, uh, you missed out, but it was a wonderful day and we thank the Lord for all that he did. Uh, we have a few things coming up that I want you to be in prayer for and then be a part of it. Coming up very shortly is our, our wild game dinner, March the 7th. If you haven't purchased your tickets yet, let's do that. This is a great outreach event to bring people in to feed them some wild game. We're going to hear from world champion Elk Collar and TV show host Chad Shearer. He's a guide and outfitter from Montana. He'll be here with us. It'll be a wonderful time. And we're going to get some good outdoor tips and uh, get the blood boiling again for hunting season coming up. And so that'll be March the 7th, but it's a wonderful time to bring those that we know and love that would uh, need to hear the gospel. And so I want to invite you to do that. March the 7th, you can buy your tickets online or through our uh, My Church Center app, and you can do that uh, even today. Uh, also, we have our marriage retreat coming up in April, and I want to encourage you to take the opportunity to invest in your marriage and be a part of that. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be fun. It's a way to get to know other people. In the church, we'll have some fun, some activities, but you're going to have plenty of free time as a husband and wife to just reconnect and to make some um, uh, good goals and and revisit some decisions and uh, look back at your marriage and look forward with hope. It's just going to be a great time. We'll be enriched and be encouraged, be instructed, and it's going to be a time of help for you. I promise you that you will come back from that refreshed and you'll be thankful that you were able to go. And so make the note uh, right now to just do it by faith. You can do it. Uh, you could put a deposit down right now for $150 and then uh, the rest upon the retreat. And so <clears throat> let's uh, let's be in prayer about that. 
I'm looking forward tonight to this to this message, and I want you to be finding in your Bible Hebrews chapter 11. We've been taking these last few weeks and maybe a couple weeks more on pictures in courage. Our theme this year is courageous. We want to see God's people live courageously in the face of adversity, in the face of all that's going on in our culture today. We want to be courageous Christians, and we want to stand for Christ and we want to make, make sure that we're boldly proclaiming the gospel and living for the Lord. And many of us are having to work in more hostile environments, hostile towards faith and Christianity especially. And we want to make sure that we're equipped to take the stand. And so tonight we're just getting some encouragement um, as we've been the last few weeks from others in the Word of God who took a stand and went through <coughs> some times of adversity and testings and trials, and they stood courageously. And so I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and look at Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to turn one other place and we'll come back to Hebrews 11 in just a minute. Uh, but let's take a moment and pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father, we thank you for what you've already done today in our hearts. We're grateful for the opportunity to um, hear from you again. And so I pray that you'll speak to our hearts tonight. I pray that you'll enrich our families and our fathers to be courageous fathers and courageous parents. And I pray that we would um, be all that you've called us to be in this generation. And Lord, we do ask for revival in these days, that you would send it to us in a way that would would open our hearts and our eyes and our our, our spiritual lives again to your holiness, the awe that we have of you, and Lord, a brokenness over sin and living for you and renew our love for you. Lord, send that to us, I pray. Give us a, a wonderful time as we study your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. In Hebrews chapter 11, we have the great hall of faith. And, uh, and we're gonna look at, I could look at this whole passage of scripture with you, but we're gonna look at verses number 17 through 19, and I want you to see a little snippet in the life of Abraham. The Bible says, by faith, Abraham. And this is the second time it is said that of Abraham in this passage of scripture. Uh, it started the story of Abraham and his journey of faith in verse eight. But in verse 17, he says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. This is a passage of scripture that is the New Testament commentary on what happened in the Old Testament in the life of Abraham. And I want to point out a, a, a very important word in this because this brings us really in the whole life of Abraham, there were many acts of faithful courage that Abraham had. When Abraham left the Ur of Chaldees, when Abraham journeyed with God into the wilderness, not knowing where he was going, when Abraham waited on God and trusted God many times during famines and difficulties when Lot was carried away into Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Abraham courageously followed God. As, as Abraham went into the wilderness, uh, following the promises of God, forsaking those well-watered plains of Sodom, Abram showed courage and faith in God. Many times he did that. But I, I can't think of another moment in Abraham's life when Abraham was put in a more precarious place than this place he's in in this story. Let's look at verse 17 again. And let me point out a word that I think is so important in our Bibles. By faith, Abraham, now watch this, when he was tried. When he was tried. This is going to be a commentary on what God did in Abraham's life in Genesis 22. We're going to look at that in just a minute and come back to Hebrews 11. But Abraham was put on trial by God. 
Uh, he was tempted of God. That's a that's a a good King James word. He was tempted of God. Uh, but Abraham was not tempted in the sense that he was tempted to sin. We go through different types of temptations and testings. This word is literally trial. He was tried. He was put on trial. That is also a word used in the King James as temptation. Uh, he was tried or tempted or tested of God. And this was a temptation or a trial orchestrated by God that was to bring Abraham out in a stronger and more purer standing of faith. This was a test of his faith to strengthen it and to purify it. Warren Wearsby said, and it's something that stuck in my heart for many, many years, he said this, a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Now, you understand as Christians, we're gonna go through different testings. When Satan tempts us, his temptings are, are often uh, run of the mill. I mean, it's a standard temptation to sin. Satan tempts us to bring the worst out in us, tempts us to sin and to, and to evil. Uh, his temptations are to cause us to fall, to weaken us. God's temptations and God's testings are to bring the best out in us and cause us to stand and to purify our faith. A great verse to, to mark down is uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, God is gonna put our, our, te our trial, our, our, our faith on trial, and that's what he's doing here with Abraham. Abraham had a son that God had given him. God had given this son. In fact, look at verse number 17 again quickly here. The Bible says that he was tried. He offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So here is Abraham had received this wonderful gift. This gift of the son Isaac, the gift of God. It was a gift of faith received in Abraham's old age. I mean, can you imagine walking out of the maternity ward on a cane, a hundred years old, having been given a son? And not just any son, but a son of promise. A son upon whom God had said in verse number 18, of whom it is said, of Isaac it is said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In other words, all of your children's children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren and your descendants, Abraham, are going to come through this son. So this is not just a son. This is a son of generations of sons that you will father in this one son. I mean, this is a gift that God has given to Abraham. And let me show you where our story finds us in Genesis chapter 22. Run back with me to Genesis 22, and I'm going to read very quickly, a lengthy passage of scripture, but you listen carefully. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here am I. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. By the way, this is the first time the word love is used in the Bible. It's used here about Abraham's affections for his only son, your son that you love. And get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham arose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto the young men, abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Notice that. I and the lad are going to go and come again to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, Father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb, <coughs> excuse me, for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering. So they both 
uh, went, both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now, notice in this passage of scripture that this is a remarkable story. This is a story that many of our liberal theologians have dismissed and said this is, this is really not a true story. This is some who have said a sovereign God would not have, have commanded Abraham to do this. Why? Because this is the first time that God ever demanded uh, a human sacrifice. And so... When we come to this story, we have to look into what was going on here. You'll notice again in verse twenty, in chapter 22 and verse 1 that it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. That's that word that Hebrews gives us the commentary on that God tried him. God put Abraham's faith on trial. And may I tell you that God is able to do that. And God will do that. And our faith that cannot withstand the heat of those kind of trials cannot be trusted. And may I say that there are some of you who've been through some fiery trials and maybe you're in the furnace now going through some fiery trials of faith and God has you there to strengthen your faith and to purify your life. And so God has these tests for us. Now there's a couple things I want you to see about this story and some of the things of courage in Abraham's life. And there are things of courage that we ought to learn. Number one is Abraham had the courage to trust God with the things that God had given him. He trusted God with the things that God had given him. Now, this was the greatest of Abraham's possessions. Isaac was the son of promise. He was the son of his old age. He was the son that God had attached all of his legacy to. The seed of Abraham was in Isaac. This was the great possession. And I want you to look back with me in Hebrews chapter 11. And in verse 17, God says here that by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. He offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now the test was over a gift that God had given to Abraham. And so why the test? Why would God test Abraham on something that God had already given Abraham? Well, perhaps Abraham was now loving Isaac more than he was loving God. Maybe he had so long yearned for this son of promise, knowing that he had betrayed the plan of God by going into Hagar and fathering Ishmael, that he had brought this son into the world that was not the son of promise. And thereby, he knew that he had created a problem and he created a, a mess. And he so longed for this son and finally, miraculously, at the end of himself, when Abraham's body was now dead and Sarah's womb now dead, God brings this son of promise, this miraculous son, and gives him to Abraham. Perhaps now Abraham has grown through these years with Isaac to love him more than he loves God. Could it be that he's coming to love the gift more than he's loving the giver? Could it be that God is moving into second place in Abraham's life? <clears throat> so now there's a test. 
that was going to prove if this was true or not. Now, I want to tell you something about why I say that and why I, I surmise that perhaps this was an issue of Abraham putting Isaac in an undue place in his life. One of the reasons I know that God will do things like this is because God will not play second fiddle to anything in your life. Many people will say, well, let's, let's just give God a place in our life. Give Jesus a place in your life. Listen, he doesn't want a place in your life. Uh, he doesn't want a prominent place in your life. Some say, well, listen, I'll have my life and I'll, and I'll speak of Jesus often and I'll, I'll give him a place of prominence. He doesn't want a place of prominence. He wants preeminence. That in all things, he might be preeminent. Now, he's not a part-time God. He doesn't look to have a dual throne and share the throne of your life with you or anything that you possess. God wants you. And this is a great question, and this is a very sobering question, but do you love the Lord supremely with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength, with all your soul? You see, we have to be very careful about the blessings that God gives us, that those blessings do not become cursings. Now, you have to remember, God is going to work all of this out for his good. This is an act of faith. Remember, when Satan tests us and tempts us, he tempts us to cause us to fall, to bring out the worst. When God tests us, it's always to bring out the best. So when we see this story in hindsight, we see a glorious picture of God, the Father, and his son, Jesus, and Mount Calvary. We see all of that. But... You have to remember that Abraham couldn't see that as clearly as we can see it looking back. Abraham was having to courageously trust God with the things that God had given him. God had given him this son. This son had all of Abraham's future hopes and covenants with him. And so now Abraham perhaps has elevated him to a place that his blessing is becoming a cursing. You say, is that really possible? Yeah, write this verse down. Malachi chapter two and verse two. Malachi two and verse two, the Bible says, God speaking to Israel, he says to Israel, but if ye will not hear me, and if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, now listen to this. Israel, if you will not hear me, if you will not lay it to heart to give glory to my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. Now listen to this next phrase. And I will curse your blessings. Israel, if you don't hear me, and if you don't lay to heart to give me glory, I'm gonna take all the blessings that I've given you and your blessings are gonna become your cursings. Can I tell you that blessings can become cursings? God goes on to say, yea, I have cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart. In other words, you're not listening to me and you're not using the blessings that I've given you to glorify me Therefore, your blessings will become a cursing. I've seen this happen many times. We're watching this in America. America, this God-blessed America is becoming a curse in this world. Our blessings are becoming our cursings. Our freedoms are being turned on our own heads. The freedoms that we have had to be able to worship God, we're using to worship ourselves and God knows whatever else we want to worship. We're using these things as horrible, horrible curses. What should be blessings. God is allowing these blessings to be turned to cursings because we've turned away from Almighty God. We've not glorified God. We were not thankful. We didn't glorify him as God. We worship the creature more than the creator. We were turned over to unclean desires and 
went after uncleanness and God gave us over to uncleanness and eventually over to a reprobate mind and then to destruction. That's the course that we've been on for a number of decades now. And you can clearly see if your spiritual eyes are working, you can clearly see that our blessings have become cursings. God is simply saying, I'm not gonna take second place to anybody. And your economy didn't make these blessings. Your ingenuity didn't make these blessings. Your politicians didn't give you these blessings. Your founding fathers didn't give you these blessings. They gave you mechanisms to preserve these blessings and to listen to me, but they didn't give them to you. These things came from God. And now you're not listening to me and you're not hearkening to me and you're not using my blessings that I've given you to glorify me. That's why I gave them to you that all the world may know that there's a God in heaven. But now you have dethroned me and enthroned yourself and the blessing has become entitlement and that entitlement is your curse and will be your detriment. This is where we are. And this is why God was testing Abraham. He didn't want Abraham to devolve. That's the human course. That is the depraved heart's course. And so God was testing Abraham. God knew that Abraham loved Isaac and God wanted Abraham to love Isaac. But can I tell you, Abraham could not love Isaac the way he should until Abraham loved God the way he must. You see, God wants to be first. Remember when Peter was standing on the shore after the resurrection of Jesus Christ? He had gone fishing. He heard the stranger from the shoreline tell him to cast the net on the other side of the boat. He took a great catch of fish. Remember, he drew them in. The boat was sinking. He brought them to shore. And there was this great catch of fish. You remember that? And Jesus stood there, already having fish on the fire. Come and dine, my children, come and dine. Hey, Simon, Simon, lovest thou me more than these? Now, some think that Jesus was saying, Simon, do you love me more than these disciples love me? And that's not what he was asking. Our love is not in competition with one another. He was not pitting his disciples against one another as to who could love him most. He was saying to Peter, Peter, do you love me more than you love these fish and these nets and these boats and these friends? Do I have a place of preeminence and supreme love in your life. The test of faith is not primarily between love and hate, but between two loves. Those things that we love dearly and those things that we must love supremely. Listen, as a husband, I am, I am called to love my wife, but I cannot love her as I ought until I love him as I must. I'm called to love my children, but I cannot love my children as, my, as I ought if I do not love the Lord as I must. When I love him with all my heart, I will love them best. I hope you understand tonight that what God was doing in Abraham's life was a test of faith. I, I'm, not, I'm not just being um, uh, trite here or trying to make a play on words. I'm, I'm giving you, I'm giving you an understanding here that God has given us things and we have to have the courage to love God more than the things that he has given to us. Oftentimes the, the children that are in heritage of the Lord, we begin to love them more than we love him. And then when we love them we make, and we love God less than we love them, we make very poor decisions about what to do for them out of a love that's out of whack. That love is not the best love because we don't have God as our first love. And so this is where God is testing Abraham. Second, and I've got to hurry, Abraham not only had the courage to trust God with the things that God had given him, number two, he had courage to trust God with the purpose God had made him for. Look back at verse number uh, 18, if you will, please of whom it is said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. God 
had made Abraham for the purpose to be the father of the faithful, the father of a nation through whom would come the Messiah, by whom the whole world would be blessed. God was going to take Abraham and make Abraham a blessing so that Abraham would bless the earth and that through him all the world could be blessed. That was the whole history of the Hebrew nation. And God said, I'm going to call your seed through this one. So Abraham in this boy, Isaac, all of the purposes of your life are wrapped up in him. You're an old man now. And all of your purpose is wrapped up in this young man. And God says, and I want you to put him to death. That's what I want, him, I want you to do. All of your descendancy is in this boy. Now put him to death. And that doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense then. It doesn't make sense now. And this is why it takes courage to trust God with his divine purposes. Because it doesn't often make sense. You see, and this is what faith is all about. Faith is, is primarily not believing God in spite of the evidence. Uh, Abraham had the evidence. His son was there. He remembered the covenant. God had made this covenant, had promised his son. And now, miraculously, a 90-year-old woman has birthed this boy. Abraham had the evidence. And believing God is not believing in spite of the evidence, it's obeying God in spite of the consequence. This is where the courage of faith is rooted. Am I going to believe God even though it's going to cost? See, obedience is the greatest proof of our trust and of our faith. The songwriter wrote it right when they said, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. It's, it's a courageous faith that obeys God when it cannot understand. God had told him what to do. And Abraham was not able to comprehend God's end purpose, but he knew that he was not going to have to put God on trial. God was not the one on trial here. Abraham's faith was on trial. Abraham had the kind of obedience that we all must have. It was not a blind obedience. Abraham had an informed obedience. Abraham didn't take from this message the idea that you need to go out and just sacrifice something in order to please God. We, we are not called to be foolish. Abraham was sacrificing something that God had informed him to sacrifice. He was in tune with God. God told him exactly what to do. Abraham knew that this is what the Lord wanted. And sometimes Christians are trying to do things God doesn't want them to do. And we're trying to get God to bless it. We talked about that a little bit this morning, but we need to hear from the Lord and then be obedient in that. When you obey, make sure that it's the voice of the Lord you're obeying. Abraham was intentional in his obedience. Um, he, he paid attention. He did exactly what God told him to do. Um, he rose up early in the morning. He went straight to where he was supposed to go. He did not delay. Uh, not only that, but he was, he was immediate in his obedience. He, he, he was obeying God the moment that God asked. He did not procrastinate. Procrastination is just another form of disobedience. He said, God, you've told me what to do. I'm going to do it. And real obedience is immediate, uh, immediate obedience. And so I want to give you this very quickly. Abraham had the courage to trust God with things that God had given to him. He had the courage to trust God with the purposes that God had for him. And then the third thing I want to give you is this. He had the courage to trust God at his word. To take God at his word. Look with me in verse number 19. Accounting 
That's the word reckon, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence he also received him in a figure. Abraham had already learned that God was the God of the impossible. Abraham had already learned that God could take a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman and bring a baby into this world. God could do the miraculous. Abraham had seen God do it. He knew that he could trust God to do the impossible. Abraham had already seen it. And Abraham knew that God had already put his word on this boy, that this was going to be the son of promise. This was the son in whom the seed would be called. This was the one. This is the one. This is the son that I've given to you. And in him are all the nations. And so Abraham had to make a choice. Am I going to have the courage to take God at his word and trust God with what God has told me and what God has promised me? God is telling me to do something that looks as though it goes against what God has promised me, but I am going to count God's word to be faithful, and I'm going to trust God at his word, and I'm going to give God what he's asking for. And What God is simply saying is this, Abraham, if you love it, let it go. And if it's yours, you'll get it back. And if not, you'll be saved from a fate worse than um, death and all that that holds. And so what was, what was he saying? It's exactly what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you love your life, lose it. If you want to lose your life for my sake and for the gospel, you'll find it. But if you find your life or you save your life, you will lose it. You know, little children, I don't know if they say it today, but when I was a kid, little children would say things like this. Um, finders keepers, losers weepers. And we'd all, we'd, maybe you said that. But you know what God says? God says, keepers weepers, losers finders. Those who keep their lives lose it. Those who lose their lives find it. Verse number 19, Abraham was accounting that God was able to raise him up from the dead. Okay, God, I'm gonna give you back what you've given me. And I'm putting the purpose that you've called me for back into your hands. And Lord, I'm gonna take you at your word and I'm gonna sacrifice the thing that you have given to me. And I'm gonna give it back to you, trusting that you will give it back to me. It's very interesting here. He said, I'm accounting this. That word is the word we get the word reckon from. It's an accounting term. It means to calculate. It's the, the Greek word is where we get our word logistics or the word logic from. We logic through. Abraham was calculating. Abraham said, okay, God, God, here, here listen. You gave me this boy. I can trust you with him. God, you have given me a purpose. You've made a covenant with me. You made a promise with me and I'm accounting that. I'm logically saying, okay, then I can do what you're asking me to do because I know that you can't lie and you're gonna keep your word and you're faithful to your promises. I don't have to understand. All I have to know is that you understand and I will trust you with that. And in just that moment when Abraham came to that full realization he heard the bleeding of that ram and he turned and there was the ram with its horns caught in a thicket. It was a, literally, it was a ram crowned with thorns. And Abraham, the Bible said, Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. Abraham saw Christ and he was glad. What Abraham teaches us is that you and I as Christians do not live by explanations. We live by promises. That we can trust God even when it doesn't make sense. I can trust God with the first dime of every dollar and know that I will have more at the end than I did before I started. I, don't, I can't make it make sense. There's not a pencil that can do that math, but God is faithful. And there are times that God has blessed people with possessions and then they've held on to those possessions and those very possessions have become their curse. 
The blessings became the cursing because they didn't give them to the Lord. And here, Abraham is a huge picture of courageously trusting God when we don't understand and saying to God, okay, here it is. You've given this to me. I'm giving it to you. I'm trusting my purposes are to be your purposes. And God, I'm taking you at your word and I'm gonna courageously obey you when everything is on the line, when my faith is in the fire. And he says, you'll come out as gold. What a joy to see it in Abraham's life. And what a help when I'm in the fire to know that God is testing me and God is gonna make my faith stronger and purer. Now listen, if you've never seen Jesus' day like Abraham did, if you've never trusted Christ, I wanna invite you to come to Christ now. I want you to come to him and pray a prayer like this. Jesus, I know that I'm lost. And I know that as a sinner, I have condemnation that is rightfully mine. But Jesus, I see you as the Lamb of God on the cross of Calvary, taking away my sins, paying for them. And I'm trusting your shed blood, your crucified body to be the payment for my sin. And Jesus, I see you as the risen Lord, alive in victory. And I'm trusting you to be my new life. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of sin. Save me and use me. I hope you pray a prayer like that. And if you need some spiritual help, you can reach out to us, email us at the church, call us at the church. We'll help you any way we can. Hey, believer, let's trust God courageously in these days. Lord, I thank you for the time tonight. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the great pictures of courage that you've shown us down through the centuries. Men and women who were used mightily in faith to show us who you are. Lord, I pray we'll take what we've heard tonight and heed it, believe it, and courageously live it. We pray that you'll bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you Wednesday night. Seven o'clock, it's gonna be a wonderful time. Awana's youth group, Bible study, prayer meeting. We'll see you there.